August 19th, St. Louis of Toulouse, Confessor, First Order. The son of Charles II of Naples and Sicily, Louis was born in 1274 and named after his uncle, the Holy King of France. It was the great concern of his mother, the niece of St. Elizabeth, to rear her many children as true servants of the King of Kings. The devout queen observed in her son, Louis, particularly blessed results of this maternal solicitude. He loved prayer, was reserved and gentle, and his whole conduct radiated angelic purity. Even as a child, he practiced mortification. On a certain occasion, after he had retired, his mother found him sleeping on a rug on the floor of his room instead of in his comfortable bed. Sweets and delicious foods he carried to the poor sick with his mother's permission. It is related that once he was leaving the dining room with a roasted pullet under his mantle, and so met his father. The king wished to see what he was carrying. Timidly, the boy laid back his mantle, and lo, it was a beautiful bouquet of flowers. When he was 14 years old, Louis was taken to Barcelona with two of his brothers as a hostage for the release of his father, who had been taken prisoner of war. Gladly did Louis accept this misfortune to obtain his father's freedom. But at the same time, the disposition with which he accepted it was astonishing in a boy of his age. Misfortune, he said, is more useful to the friends of God than good fortune, for on such occasions they can prove their loyalty to their Lord. Under the guidance of several excellent Franciscan friars who were appointed teachers to the young princes, Lewis made remarkable progress in virtue as well as in secular knowledge. In public debates, he manifested his mastery of the various branches of knowledge, both sacred and profane. Theology was his favorite subject. So devoid was he of ambition that he planned to renounce his claims to the throne in order to devote himself entirely to the service of God. About this time, he became seriously ill. He made a vow that if he recovered, he would join the Order of Friars Minor. The sickness immediately took a turn for the better, but the superiors of the order hesitated to receive the young prince without the consent of the king, his father. Louis was thus obliged to defer his pious design. <clears throat> At the end of six years, his captivity ended. On returning home, after much pleading, he finally obtained the permission of his father to settle his claims on his brother Robert and to become a priest. Not very long after his ordination, and although he was only 21 years old, he was selected by Pope Boniface VIII for the bishopric of Toulouse. Whatever is lacking to the young priest in age and experience, said the Pope, his extraordinary knowledge, his maturity of mind, and his holiness of life will amply supply. Lewis had to yield to the Pope's wishes, but he requested that he might first be admitted into the Order of Friars Minor. That request was granted. The royal prince was overjoyed to be permitted for a time at least, to perform the humblest exercises in the garb of a son of St. Francis. In Rome, he went from door to door gathering alms. The Pope himself officiated at the ceremony of Episcopal consecration, and shortly afterwards, Louis left to assume the government of his diocese. His noble birth, and above all the fame of his sanctity, caused him to be received at Toulouse like a messenger from heaven. The entire city went out to meet him, and everybody was enchanted with the modesty, sweetness, and angelic virtue which radiated from his face and bearing. A sinner who for many years had lived a wicked life cried out at sight of him, Truly this man is a saint, and then turned away from his sinful habits and led a better life. 
A woman who doubted the sanctity of the young man went to church one morning to attend the mass which the bishop was celebrating. Then she too cried out, Ah, yes, our bishop is a saint. Bishop Lewis led the poor and rigorous life of a friar minor and devoted himself with all solicitude to the welfare of his diocese. The poor were his best friends, and he fed twenty-five of them daily at his own table. His ministry, however, was destined to be short-lived. He died in the twenty-fourth year of his life, having been bishop no longer than a year and a half. He received the last sacraments on the Feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, and on the 19th of August, 1297, while pronouncing the holy name of Mary, he yielded his soul to God. Because of the many miracles that were wrought at his tomb, he was canonized as early as 1317, during the lifetime of his mother. <clears throat> A patron for youthful students. What better example than that of St. Louis could be held up to youthful students? He distinguished himself from his youth by modesty and docility, and throughout his life he preserved his purity unsullied. He appreciated and loved his teachers and applied himself diligently to his studies, in which he was very successful. <clears throat> he directed all his efforts to the honor of God and the salvation of his fellow men, and preserved a cheerful disposition even in adversity. That is the type of student every Christian youth should desire to be. The saint who gave them so brilliant an example on earth will also be a powerful patron and intercessor for them in heaven. Consider how important the good behavior of youthful students is to human society. They will be the future teachers and governors, the directors and leaders of society. Their predominant sentiments will be the dominating policies of the majority of the people. For that reason, much depends on how youthful students grow up. They are encompassed by many dangers, and how many of them lose their innocence and their faith to the detriment of the many over whom they later exercise influence. Those who are associated with students and can offer them guidance have the obligation to direct them toward virtue and to point out to them such saintly examples as St. Louis of Toulouse. But it is likewise the duty of every Christian frequently to recommend youthful students to so powerful a patron as St. Louis. Consider how the example and the protection of St. Louis can help youthful students, especially in two grave dangers that threaten them, sensuality and ambition. How frequently the one vice wrecks the body and the other gnaws at the young soul. The mortification which Louis practiced from his earliest years and the childlike devotion he fostered to our Blessed Lady made him secure in temperance and purity. His love for the poor and his lively faith kept him so far away from ambition that he chose the lesser station of a friar minor to that of a royal throne. That is why he is now wearing the imperishable crown of heavenly glory. In behalf of students, let us frequently invoke him in the words of Holy Church in the office for his feast. Vernal rose of charity, lily of purity, shining star, vessel of sanctity, pray to the Lord for us. Prayer of the Church O God, who didst teach thy holy confessor and bishop, Louis, to prefer the heavenly kingdom to one of earth, 
and didst marvelously clothe him with stainless purity and extraordinary love for the poor. Grant that by imitating his virtues here on earth, we may deserve to be crowned by thee in heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Louis of Toulouse, pray for us.